Welcome to this presentation which explores further the relationship between Elizabeth I and Nonsuch Palace in Surrey. Many of you will have watched my presentation on the portrait of Queen Elizabeth which hangs in Hampton Court Palace. I will start with a brief summary to remind you of some of the important points. The artist was Marcus Gearhartz the Younger who also painted the rainbow portrait both around 1600. The subject is a sad, pregnant young woman in a magnificent gown standing under a walnut tree on the edge of a stream and crowning a weeping stag. On the right of the picture is a sonnet written in the first person with the theme of wrongdoing and loss of a child. Hidden within the picture is reference to William Shakespeare's poem The Phoenix and the Turtle Dove. Although the portrait has had many alterations in the 400 years since it was painted, analysis by my series of digital photographs has helped reveal some of its features. The portrait is highly allegorical, in essence an illustrated sonnet with the theme of the myth of Diana the goddess and Actaeon the hunter, who, having spied on her bathing, was turned into a stag and rendered mute. I became convinced that the portrait was of Queen Elizabeth for a whole series of reasons explained in the presentation. She was depicted as pregnant and was wearing rings around her neck to denote some form of betrothal. The stag represented someone who had wronged her and to whom she was expressing regret at having ostracised or rendered mute. She is also lamenting the loss of a child. I should say I was delighted by the response to the presentation. It certainly stimulated some discussion, which of course was the whole point of the exercise. I do intend to produce an update shortly. In part one, we had a good look at the Palace of Nonsuch, learning about its history and something about Elizabeth's involvement there. This drawing of the palace was made after the 1959 excavations and shows the land lying to the west of the palace itself. At this stage, Cherry Orchard Farm stood close to the palace, but this is now gone. The land next to the palace was called the Wilderness and Orchard. Further west, there was a banqueting house. And in between is an area termed the Grove of Diana. This is a satellite view of the site. If we overlay the plan, the layout can more clearly be seen. The approach to the palace was along an avenue of trees. And as we saw in part one, the moan area marks out the eastern half of the palace itself. So let's look at each area of the garden in turn. The wilderness was described by Anthony Watson sometime after 1582. Leaving the Privy Garden we enter the wilderness, which is in fact neither deserted nor wild. The land is somewhat hilly and plentifully watered and is set out in lofty lines of trees to the south and west. Sandy paths led through a dense wood. Parts of the walks were boarded and partitioned off for ball games. Some of the trees were trimmed and trained, both for shelter and as topiary, and among the trees were wire-netted aviaries. The concept of the wilderness in Tudor gardens was borrowed from classical traditions. It contrasted sharply with the formality of the privy garden, but was still very much a managed area. The wilderness at Nonsuch consists of three paths. The central one, was sandy and there were two outer ones which were grassy. A variety of fruit trees was planted including plum, apple, cherry and pear. The trees were largely deciduous including walnut, oak, ash and yew. At ground level were planted strawberries, ferns and honeysuckle. There was a large plane tree the branches of which had been cut and rested on posts thus providing a place of shade for the visitors to sit. Watson went on to describe that many people sit down, converse on various topics and listen to the calls of the animals and the songs of the birds. 
they gaze upon the wire-fenced enclosures crowded with pheasants and partridges from across the sea. There were also peacocks and guinea fowl. Visitors to the wilderness were interrupted by the calls of wild animals, for as Watson continues, the wilderness is from time to time shattered by the terrifying roar of lions, or now resounds with the savage grunt of the foaming boar. Here a bear falls killed by the shot from a gun, there a deer struck by a forester's spear breathes its last. Here the mute crocodile, armed with sharp claws, pursues those that flee, and flees from its pursuers, pouring out tears at the sight of a man, but snaps him up if he comes too near. On the other hand, cunning dogs fill the whole place with baying, and are urged on through the wilderness in a swift hunt. Quite how this menagerie was created was not explained, one assumes much was conducted by actors dressed in costumes. There is no doubt that the whole experience must have lasted long in the memory. The central path through the wilderness provided a vista towards the banqueting house. This stood on a small hill and was three storeys high with cellars underneath. The base was brick and the structure was wood. It was quadrangular in shape and at each corner of the whole house there was a balcony for prospect. Effectively this gave each level four bay windows. The lowest floor was a wood panelled hall and most of the other rooms were also panelled. Unfortunately no pictures of the building survive. We know that the support stanchions were clad in lead. There was a lead roof on top of which there was a lantern. There were distant views across to the palace and park from its balconies. The structure was a hundred feet across. Remarkably, the base of the banqueting house has survived, although it is now tree covered. Walking around it gives some impression of the scale of the building. This was an after dinner party house for wine, fruit, music and masks. There was a 40 foot wide promenade around the building for summer entertainment. Such buildings were quite common in Elizabethan gardens. Not surprisingly, the ones constructed of wood have not uh, survived. Here is the plan of the non such building showing the uh, cellar and kitchen in the centre and the brick walls of the base. This photograph shows the excavation of 1959 with the oven in the corner of the cellar. This is part of one of the corners of the brick base and this is looking up the slope towards the banqueting house which as you can see is now completely covered in trees. On the right at the bottom, the boundary wall is just visible. There's no doubt this was a party venue and must have been a wonderful setting on a summer's evening. In order to understand the next delight of the garden, we need to think about groves. These were one of the ways in which classical knowledge was translated into an Elizabethan garden setting. These were areas of woodland, wilder than formal gardens, yet still used for pleasure and inhabited by mythological deities whom they honoured. Trees were arranged to create copses and glades with shaded walks contrived by topiary. Here the landscape abandoned its symmetry, but not its meaning. Groves were also sacred spaces frequently dedicated to deities and ascribed metaphorical significance. They often included a significant and symbolic. To the northeast of the banqueting house was the Grove of Diana, which is thought to have been created by Lord Lumley, son-in-law of Arundel in the 1580s, as it contained his coat of arms. As Watson describes, Diana herself lurks in the shadows near the Vale of Gargaffy with its icy spring. Natural water springs out of a rock and into a basin 
and on this was portrayed the great lifelike execution of the story of how Diana and her nymphs took their bath naked and sprinkled water onto the hunter Actaeon who was spying on them, putting out the flames of love and turning him into a stag. He stands nearby, sprinkled with inscriptions by Diana and her nymphs. So what does all this mean? Who was Diana and where was Gargaphi? Firstly, you need to know more about this man, whom we met briefly earlier, Publius Ovidius Nasso, born 43 BC in Italy and died in Constantia, Romania. He was better known as Ovid. Ovid wrote a very long poem extended to 15 books. Its title was Metamorphoses, changing physical shape like a tadpole to a frog. The poem tells the history of the world from Adam to Roman times in a series of some 250 scenes based mainly on mythology. The poem was written in Latin and translated into English in the 1560s by Arthur Golding, gentleman. The image shows this first edition from 1567. It was dedicated to Robert Dudley and bears the crest of the Dudley family, the Bear and Baculus. Arthur Golding was the uncle of Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford who many, including myself, believe was the true author of the works of Shakespeare. In fact, Golding was a very doer individual and was living in the same house as de Vere when he did the work, and many believe it was the teenaged Earl who did the translations, many of which are somewhat salacious. There is no doubt that Ovid's work gave much inspiration for the works of Shakespeare. For further interest, Ovid was banished from Rome by Emperor Augustus for his views. Ovid attributes this uh, to a poem and a mistake. There is a parallel here with the life of de Vere who was airbrushed out of history for his views. The Grove at Nonsuch makes reference to Ovid's retelling of the Greek myth of Minerva, who is also known as Diana in Roman folklore, and Actaeon. Diana was goddess of the hunt and the moon and was associated with wild animals and woodland as well as being the virgin goddess of childbirth who swore never to marry. She preferred to dwell on high mountains and in sacred woods and is depicted as a beautiful youthful huntress carrying bow and arrows. Her attribute is a diadem which is a small jewelled crown shaped as a crescent moon. Here she is ready for the hunt. The painting by Luca Penny is from Fontainebleau. The figure is based on Diane de Poitiers, the mistress of Henry II of France. I'm sure this painting was an interesting topic of conversation between the king and his wife, wherever it was hung in the palace. The grove in Diana and Actaeon is in the mythical Vale of Gargaphi, which is said to be on Mount Githyron, close to Thebes in Greece. So here is a satellite image of Greece with Athens on the right. The area we are interested in is here. If we zoom in, we can see Thebes in the north and the modern town of Plataea in the middle, and then at the bottom, the sub summit ridge of Mount Githyron. By my reckoning, this is likely to have been the site of the Vale of Gargaphi. Translated, it means of broad poplars. Here is Ovid's description of the valley. There was a valley clothed in hanging woods of pine and cypress named Gargaphi, sacred to chase Diana, Huntress Queen. Deep in its farthest comb, framed by the woods, a cave lay hid, not fashioned by man's art, but nature's talent copied artistry. For in the living limestone she had carved a natural arch, and there a limpid spring flowed lightly, babbling into a wide pool, its waters girdled with a grassy sward. Here, tired after the hunt, 
The goddess loved her nymph to bathe her with water's balm. Diana had been angry that she'd been seen naked together with her nymphs by Actaeon. He was a hunter who'd been watching them. She defied him to tell what he had seen. Then she sprinkled him with water in revenge, turning him into a dumb stag, which is killed then by its 50 hunting dogs. In the original Greek myth, individual poets were left to interpret the punishment meted out to Actaeon. The Romans preferred the gory version, and this was picked up by Renaissance artists. This drawing from Fontainebleau, copied from one by Luca Penny, and carried out well before the English version of the tale was available. Note how the water is being thrown up over him by the goddess. Greek mythology was very popular in Tudor times, being part of the Renaissance movement. Sir Roy's strong art historian suggested that in the Grove of Diana, nature was used as an allegory for the first time in Elizabethan England. On the artistic level, this contrasts with the Privy Garden. In the Grove, the visitor entered the setting of a classical story, consciously constructed as a theatrical experience. I'll explain shortly why this particular scene might have been created. Titian produced his interpretation of the event in 1560. This was uh, complete with a Diana who seems to have outgrown her head. He followed this up with the death of Actaeon in the late 1560s. This time he'd been shot with an arrow by Diana and still had not quite transformed into a stag. In parallel with painting, Renaissance gardens also featured Diana stroke Artemis. This fountain is in the gardens of the Villa d'Este in Tivoli near Rome. She is shown here in her guise of motherhood to humanity with water spouting from a chest full of breasts. She is derived from this first century carving from the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. In fact, the multiple breasts may actually be an incorrect interpretation of the statue. Researchers indicated that it was copied from an original wooden statue and the prominences were designed to attach offerings and gifts to the goddess. In another part of the uh, garden is the Grotto of Diana. Anybody who's been to Ephesus will recognise the depiction of the library there in the background. The grotto is a large underground vaulted chamber decorated in 1570 by Paolo Caladrino. It has a series of caves completely covered with mosaics of mythological scenes with images of fish, dragons, dolphins, pelicans and other animals as well as the eagles and apples of the Deste family. The central feature was a rustic fountain with a statue of the goddess Diana in a large niche decorated with stucco reliefs of landscapes, the sea and a ship. All of the statues were sold in the 18th century and are now in the Capitoline Museum in Rome. This garden was all about honouring Diana as a goddess rather than focusing on her encounter with Actaeon. I can find no reference to anything similar to that which was constructed and non such in any other Renaissance garden. There are no images of the display, but it was described in some detail in 1600 by Baron Waldenstein. We entered the famous grove of Diana, where nature is imitated with so much skill that you would dare to swear that the original grove of the real Diana herself was hardly more delightful or of greater beauty. The grove is approached by a gentle slope leading down from a garden path hidden in the shade of the trees. This leads to the fountain of Diana itself. 
The spring rises in a secluded glade at the foot of a little cliff. The source was from a number of pipes hidden in the rock, and from them a gentle flow bathed Diana and her two nymphs. Actian had approached, he was leaning against a nearby tree to hide himself and gazing lecherously at Diana. She, with a slight gesture of her hand towards him, was slowly changing his head into that of a stag, his three hands in close pursuit. Reports indicate that the figures were painted in flesh colours. It would take another 200 years to achieve this level of sophistication of imagery. This is the Diana Fountain at the Palace of Caserta in Italy. It was created by Persico, Brunelli and Solari. Watson describes the scene after Actian, the stag, ran into the woods. Now the Divine Virgin enjoys the pleasures of the Rockwell in peace, washes her limbs in the icy liquid and listens to the wily hounds, pursuing with pleasing barks the new stag through all the wood. Of no matter what art, nature or divinity it may be, who does not admire in this hardest rock the skilful arrangement of stones, the plentiful variety of blossoms and fruits, but especially how the rush of spraying water now subsides with gentle murmur, now bubbles up on high in full force. At Caserta, the whole scene of Actian's demise plays out in front of your eyes. In the middle of the Vale of Gargaphia, non such was a bower dedicated to Diana. We're given no details of the construction of the bower, but Watson's account continues, where the most renowned goddess bathes the snowy parts of her virgin body. The way leads through the middle of the Vale to a stately bower, which was usually a shady area under the trees. This had a winged eagle on top of its arch, with a pelican on one pinnacle and a phoenix on the other. The pelican is a symbol of self-sacrifice, with the mother pelican often shown pecking its own breast to feed its offspring with blood. The phoenix, connected with virginal purity, represents imperial renewal, implying that the queen will recreate a new golden age. The pelican and phoenix were both symbols used by Elizabeth and portraits of them were painted for her in the 1570s by Nicholas Hilliard. On the left is the pelican portrait, on the right the phoenix portrait. Nearby was the equivalent of a bandstand for musicians. The arboretum in which all this stood also contained pyramids and fountains, one with birds disgorging streams of water, another with hidden pipes to drench the unwary. There was also a maze and the formal fountain to Diana. This is the one which its thought was being referred to. The drawing was found in the Red Velvet book from 1590. It was described as a caryatid fountain, in other words, one where the human figure supports an architectural feature. It is obviously derived from the statue of Artemis from Ephesus, but for the English viewer, the profusion of breasts has been replaced by spouting lion heads. The curious headpiece appears to be based on the crown imperial flower, surmounted by a royal crown and the crescent moon, of Diana. Wooden steps nearby and a post and rail fence guided the visitor to a woodland palace just past the fountain. It was in the form of a small vaulted temple. Once again we're not told of its construction. Watson continues, further on we came to a small vaulted temple where there is a fine marble table where inscribed here thus on the nearest wall is this. 
The goddess of chastity gives no unchaste counsels. She does not counsel disgrace, she avenges it. They are the fruits of an evil mind and an evil spirit. On the right hand wall was written, from an impure fountain, impure springs, from an unpleasant mind, a sight defiled. On the left hand side was written, shade for the heated, a seat for the weary. In the shade thou shalt not become shady, nor sitting grow serpent eyed. So what does all this mean? Well, in 1991, Michael Leslie, writing on the gardens of eloquence, gives us an explanation. Nonsuch offers a series of experiences as the visitor follows his path. At the heart of the garden, there is a challenge to the onlooker. The visitor is asked to read the scene and apply the moral. It seems to me that the moral is pretty clear. If you're involved in any sort of vice, you will be punished. Reference to Diana and Action was also made at Whitehall Palace, where there was an inscription at the entrance to the park at the back of the palace. It was later moved to Nonsuch, where it was probably more suited to the Grove of Diana. Elizabeth herself was frequently portrayed as the chaste Diana, and there is a clear reference to the Queen in the final lines, which read as follows. A fisherman who has been wounded learns, though late, to beware, but the unfortunate Actian always presses on. The chaste virgin naturally pitied, but the powerful goddess revenged the wrong. Let Actaeon fall a prey to his dogs, an example to youth, a disgrace to those that belong to him. May Diana live in the care of heaven, the delight of mortals, the security of all those that belong to her. What we see here are two clear elements of the Queen's persona, the chaste virgin and the powerful goddess. We can interpret the message thus, anyone with any sense learns by their mistakes, only an idiot repeats them. Although the human side of the queen sympathises, the goddess side reaps revenge. She is acting for the good of all. The interesting distinction between the chaste virgin and the powerful goddess is that it signals that although the queen may have pity on Actaeon, in other words, anybody who kept crossing her, the goddess element overrode this and punished him. This firmly establishes her ability to control her courtiers. It is likely uh, that the grove was begun by Arundel, but took some years to complete. The sculptures were probably completed by Lumley sometime between Arundel's death in 1580 and 1592 when the Queen took ownership. Lumley was an extremely learned man who, as we have discovered, accumulated a large library. There is a hypothesis that there was a political impetus behind the construction of a sanctuary of a virgin goddess. In short, Arundel and Lumley's discomfiture at their association with the Duke of Norfolk's scheme to marry Mary Queen of Scots in 1569 and 72. Representing Elizabeth as Diana, Arundel and Lumley constructed an allegorical act of contrition, both in tribute to the Queen and a warning to any who should attempt to cross her. In choosing to identify Elizabeth with a virgin huntress, Arundel and Lumley signified their intention to meddle no more in Elizabethan marital politics. The Queen made a special visit to Nonsuch in October of 1574 and again in the progress of 1576, when she would have had opportunities to view any changes Arundel had made to the gardens. The central message of the Grove was thus, according to this analysis, an apology 
for the involvement with Norfolk. The wounded fisher had learned his lesson and grown wise after a spell as a political outcast. This wisdom is contrasted with the actions of Actian. The passage then would be a clear warning to would-be plotters and a declaration of loyalty to Elizabeth. There is, I think, however, a better explanation. Given that Elizabeth was a regular visitor and that the palace and gardens were important social venues, it seems highly likely to me that she had a hand in designing the Vale of Gargaffy for her own purposes. Firstly, as a place to enjoy while living the dream of being the mythical goddess, but secondly, it was a powerful warning from her. Enjoyed by many as a social event, entry into the world of the goddess would have been, among the jollity, a stark reminder of their fate if they crossed her. I suspect that Lumley was an instrument to achieve this end. Although he was hopelessly in debt, I suspect that he footed the bill for the developments in the garden as well as the upkeep of the palace. This was why his name and impraises were allowed to be displayed. Elizabeth was well practised in exploiting people, often to the point of ruination, as happened with the Devereux family. There is one more important aspect to all of this, and that involves water. I said at the start that the site for the palace was partly chosen for an ample supply of water from the Epsom Downs. Well, this was not ordinary water, and to understand its significance, we need to go back to Henry VIII. The Roman practice of bathing returned to England in the 16th century. It came from the traditional Muslim rituals of Istanbul to Venice and spread through Europe as part of the Renaissance. Alongside other cultural revivals arose a new regard for the use of mineral waters in bathing and healing. The Italian University of Padua near Venice set out to recover, translate and study the texts of the ancient civilizations of Greece and Rome. By the 16th century, it was considered the premier medical school in the civilized world. The fact that Padua possessed nearby numerous celebrated hot water mineral springs used for bathing was no coincidence. The university attracted scholars from throughout Europe and the Tudor physicians, Linica, Chambray, Edward Wotton, all held Padua medical degrees. The Renaissance movement spread to England about this time, particularly under the enterprising influence of Henry VIII, who set out to restructure the then art, rather than science of healing, from the former rather dubious collection of operatives and practices of the time. Henry VIII took a direct interest in advances in medicine, and his knowledge was at least equal to that of his advisers. In 1511, two years after Henry came to power, the Medical Act determined that practitioners of physic and surgery should be qualified at university or licensed by a bishop after examination. Shortly afterwards, Thomas Lineker established what was later to become the Royal College of Physicians. Amongst Henry VIII's doctors was one Augustine de Augustinis, born in Venice, he often travelled with the European court and was involved at a high level in medical practices, in particularly the treatment of leg ulcers by mineral water bathing. By 1537, Augustine was one of the four physicians on Henry VIII's medical staff. Evidence that Henry VIII pursued a Renaissance lifestyle, which included bathing, emerged from the excavations of the Royal Palace in Whitehall in 1939. This included a steam room and a substantial tiled sunken bath which had green tiles and was about three feet deep with steps down at one end. This was later identified as a cold plunge pool. In addition, there was a continental style ceramic tiled stove based on designs installed in Germany which heated both the water and the bath chamber. The Whitehall bathing facility was in situ during the last decade of Henry's life and this coincided with the construction of Nonsuch Palace. 
The issue of water from the local springs had been estimated at four and a half million gallons a day, although many of these sources have now been lost due to changing water tables and drainage schemes. The springs provided both magnesium sulphate impregnated water, which was used as a purgative, and the more prolific chalk aquifer water, which was pure groundwater filtered through limestone. The proximity of the Yule Springs to Nonsuch makes it likely that the waters were employed for medicinal use either in the palace or at the springs themselves. An aqueduct carried the water from the springs to the basins and the fountains. It was known that watercourses ran hidden through the innermost parts of the wilderness and grove and broke out gently in the neighbouring valley there the, where there was a pond with shoals of trout, as described by visitors at the time. This corresponds to the lake which was in the garden of what was later called Yule Castle. As you could see, at one stage there was a Japanese garden. Here is an image of how it looked. The whole area has now been completely built over. Italian architects and craftsmen were employed for the new palace importing modern Renaissance knowledge and technology. Nonsuch was therefore a demonstration of England exercising its supremacy over Rome, adopting the celebration of healing, pleasure and beauty through its utilisation of the mineral waters, landscaping and buildings, yet taking directly inspiration from Italy. As such, it endorsed the monarch's personal supremacy over the Italian church by demonstrating comparable opulence. Hensner, a German tourist, describes Nonsuch in 1598 as a place pitched upon by pleasure itself to dwell along with health. Tradition states that Elizabeth used the water facilities in the Grove of Diana for bathing. She even insisted on a daily supply of water being brought to the palace from the Yule Springs. It's recorded that the monarch's bathing was carried out at least once a month, a part of her healthy regime. Elizabeth's awareness of the benefits of natural waters for health is further endorsed by her willingness to allow the imprisoned Mary Queen of Scots to attend Buxton in 1573 with further visits in ensuing years. She also dispatched Sir Christopher Hatton to Spa in Belgium in 1573. In 1568, an Englishman, William Turner, who studied in Italy, wrote a book of the nature and properties as well of the baths in Germany and Italy for all such persons that cannot be healed without the help of natural baths. It became the first textbook available for the establishment of spas. Under the general rules, he recommended May and September as the best time for bathing and then outlined ancillary requirements such as purging, diet and exercise. He also detailed the effects of alum mineralised baths, which is particularly relevant to the purging wells in the vicinity of Yule. Before I pull all this together, there is one other interesting finding which may be relevant, and this concerns a play by Ben Jonson entitled Cynthia's Revels, or The Fountain of Self-Love. The first recorded performance was at court at Christmas 1600, like many of the plays at this time, the aim was to ridicule some of Johnson's contemporaries. You can see from the 1616 edition the regalia of the United Kingdom, with the lion and the rose of England and the thistle and the unicorn of Scotland. The play is a comedy and an allegory representing Elizabeth's court in which all the members have to drink from the fountain of self-love. There are three masks and at the end they all reveal their faces. Cynthia finds that bad members have been impersonating good and as this is a comedy they are punished by a telling off and chased away. So far so ridiculous. 
There are, however, several things of interest here. The play is set, guess where, the Vale of Gargaffi. The name Cynthia is synonymous with Diana, i.e. Elizabeth. There are two characters who are in the play in name only, Actaeon and Narcissus, both of whom we are told died at the fountain of self-love. At the start of the play, it's reported that Cynthia has arranged the revels in memory of Actaeon's death. At the end of the play, Cynthia says that Actaeon, by presuming he was exceedingly fair, has met a terrible death. Cynthia wants to make his fate a lesson for the self-conceited mortals who dare challenge the divine powers. As for Narcissus, in mythology he was forced to gaze at his reflection in a clear pool as a punishment for not returning the love of Echo. Narcissus pined away and died. In pity the gods changed him into a lovely flower, a daffodil, bending its head onto the water. In the play, Echo laments the death of her lover beside the fountain in the valley of Gargaffi, which is where he died. Is this all some coincidence, or is Johnson making some sort of a point? Many commentators conclude that Actaeon represented the Earl of Essex. There is, however, one inconvenient fact. The play was both written and performed before he died. The Essex Rebellion was in early 1601. There were many variations and additions to the play at later date and the argument goes that the Actaeon sections were added later. I'm not so sure, as this does seem to be an integral part of the reason for the whole play, in order to warn the court not to cross her by being too consumed by self-love. There is another man who was consumed by self-love. This is the first section of Sonnet 62 by William Shakespeare, Edward de Vere written during the 1590s. Sin of self-love possesseth all mine eye, and all my soul, and all my every part. For this sin there is no remedy, it is so grounded inward in my heart, methinks no face so gracious as is mine. By the time the play had been written, Edward de Vere had been ostracised from court, and his reputation destroyed the reasons for which have never been entirely clear. However, there is increasing evidence that at least part of it was due to a serious scandal. The brilliant work of Alexander War, which is all on YouTube, is gradually uncovering a love triangle between De Vere, his mistress, Lady Penelope Rich, the Dark Lady of the Sonnets, and Henry Rosalie, the third Earl of Southampton, the youth of the Sonnets, an illegitimate son sired by Rosalie, was being brought up as the 18th Earl of Oxford. Such was the scale of the scandal that poets and writers of the day were obsessed with it, creating a barrage of allusions to it in their work. Rosalie was another man consumed by self-obsession. Indeed, at the age of 19, he was the dedicatee of a poem by John Clapham entitled Narcissus. This is the same man who was the subject of the first 17 of Shakespeare's sonnets, which have the central theme of trying to convince him to break out of his self-obsession and preserve his virtues by fathering a child. Could these two men be represented by Actaeon and Narcissus in Johnson's play? I think they are. It is true that both were still alive, but this was an allegory based on the court and as far as this was concerned, they were dead to it. Well, I've taken you on a long journey, which has taken you to a place quite justifiably referred to as the Pearl of the Realm. What a treasure it would have been had none such in its gardens survived. Very few people have even heard of it. Indeed, many who visit walk straight past the pillars marking its position thinking that the non-such mansion is the palace. I do hope that you found the presentation of interest. It's now time to draw some conclusions from what I've discussed. I've described to you a story about a king 
who built for himself and his son an incomparable palace to celebrate their elevation to godlike status. One of the reasons for citing the palace was the abundance of spring water, the merits of which the king was well aware. His daughter became increasingly involved in the development of the palace and its gardens. It became her favourite place, even though it was the smallest of her residences. The influence of the classics spread from Italy during the Renaissance and that of the work of the Roman poet Ovid, particularly his Metamorphoses, was very strong. Its themes were incorporated into the designs of the palace wall, the palace gardens, as well as literature and art. Queen Elizabeth chose to associate herself with the goddess Diana. Although primarily associated with hunting, Diana was also revered as the goddess of the woods, children, childbirth, fertility, chastity, the moon and wild animals, indeed all things to all life, if you will. Whether or not the depiction of the story of Actaeon in the gardens led to her adopting it, or whether she actively designed it, is not known. The local spring certainly provided an ideal setting for the depiction. The palace and gardens allowed Elizabeth to live the life of a goddess, hunting by day and possibly occasionally bathing in clear spring waters, isolated from life in London. I propose there was a dual purpose in being portrayed as a goddess. The creation of a dual personality, a warm, sociable persona and a harsh and cruel one, allowing one side of her personality to absolve herself from the difficult choices that had to be made in order to keep control of her courtiers. Reports indicate that the palace was a party house, the site of lavish entertainments for both the court and dignitaries. It's easy to see how a visit to the Grove of Diana would be a stark warning to everyone that the Queen, as her alter ego Diana, would not hesitate to strike anyone down who crossed her. Now you might be thinking what all this has got to do with the painting hanging in Hampton Court Palace, which is the subject of my first presentation. Many of you commented that Elizabeth would never have posed for such a picture. Others said that the subject was far too young to be her and she'd never been pregnant. But well, we have to remember that the picture was an allegory. The scene never happened. Elizabeth would not have posed for a portrait around 1600. All of the later portraits were adapted from an earlier pattern developed by the artist Nicholas Hilliard, that of the face of eternal youth. In addition, this is a portrait of Elizabeth as Diana, who was usually shown as a young huntress. As for a pregnancy, Elizabeth had absolute power and the threat of removal of your tongue or worse was a big incentive for people to keep quiet. The machinations of William Cecil, the official Elizabethan censor, must also be considered. Someone commissioned this painting to make a point. In my view, not a very complimentary one. What better way to do this than to portray the Queen as Diana in the setting with which she was most familiar, that of Nonsuch Gardens? The theme of regret by the mortal queen for the transgressions of her divine alter ego follows directly from the themes displayed in the Grove of Diana. Here we have a royal tree and even today there are many walnut trees on the site. Analysis of the image reveals a rock pool and a stream, one that is running downhill from the horizon. This can only mean that it was a spring. There is evidence that at some point in the painting's life there were flowers around the site, very typical of Nonsuch. The existence of Ben Jonson's play, Cynthia's Revels, uses the same principle as the painting, with reference to the death of Actaeon and Narcissus, who I would argue represent Edward de Vere and Henry Rosalie. I believe that my findings concerning the relationship between Elizabeth and Nonsuch Palace add further weight to the already strong case for the painting being that of Elizabeth in her guise as Diana, who having just bathed is wearing a robe. 
It has to be said that Elizabeth had an almost endless supply of fantastic clothes. Perhaps the one shown here was one of them. Interestingly, most of Marcus Skierhart's external portraits have a receding scene on one side of the subject. Here is such an example of a painting of Captain Thomas Lee. Don't worry about the fact that he has no trousers on. The background is of the Irish countryside, locking the painting into a location. This raises the possibility of the original painting of Elizabeth having a recognisable structure, such as the banqueting house or even non such palace in the background, this being overpainted to conceal the reference. And then what about the identity of the stag? Well, I still believe that this was Edward de Vere, the author of the Shakespeare canon, rather than Essex. As I discussed in the first presentation, there is a reference to the Shakespearean poem contained in the painting. De Vere crossed the Queen so many times with his feckless behaviour, culminating in the scandal over Lady Penelope Rich. Ostracised from court, financially ruined, silenced from being able to reveal himself as the author of his works, he was a broken man. I still believe that it was he who commissioned the painting to embarrass the Queen, to reveal what the humane side of her personality should have been suffering for what she'd done to him. After all, the poem is about loss of a child, which still puts Henry Rosley in the frame as the son of Queen Elizabeth and Edward de Vere. I'll be taking a closer look at the poem in the cartouche in another presentation, as this does give us further clues. Have I found the grove of Diana? Well, I thought I had. I visited Nonsuch on a very hot day in the summer of 2020. I began scrambling around northeast of the banqueting house on a fairly steep slope and came across what looked like the entrance to a cavern. With great excitement, I then came across this site, which was fenced off and partly covered. Secret excavations, I thought. As it turned out, I was in the middle of the old abandoned non-such pottery and the mounds were part of a BMX circuit. Professor Biddle has said that preliminary studies have located structures buried in this area, but these would need to be investigated by a large-scale investigation. So that about wraps it up. Thank you very much for watching. Please do go and see Nonsuch Park and the magnificent model of the palace in the mansion house. It's very easy to imagine yourself in the middle of a huge hunting estate. You do need more imagination to envisage the palace and the privy garden. Hopefully my presentation will help you.